Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines we're tracking for you this evening. Big global queues dent the last street as stock markets wipe out early gains ending in the red. The Sensex down 500 points. The Nifty loses over 150 points. A mixed day for Adani Group with four stocks hitting the upper circuit and another four stocks ending in the red. The group adds 4,500 crore rupees to its market cap today. But the total value is still 52% lower to level seen before the Hindenburg report. Well, in semiconductors now, the United States and the world actually is, is overly dependent on Taiwan. 93% of the world's most advanced semiconductors are produced in Taiwan. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says America wants to establish a close strategic alliance with India on semiconductors. Says 93% of the world cannot be dependent on Taiwan for semiconductors. Sees great synergies with India on chip design and technology. That's an exclusive. I'm hopeful by the end of, by the end of this year, uh, we could we could have all of the agreements as between the governments. U.S. hopes to thrash out differences with India to bolster the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Commerce Secretary Raimondo expects to resolve all differences by the end of the year. India not yet a full member of the 14-nation group, which accounts for 40% of the world GDP due to differences over data and privacy laws. The power ministry crafts a multi-pronged strategy to meet increased power demand during the summer season. Power companies directed to ensure there is no load shedding. Coal-based plants to undertake maintenance well in advance imported coal-based plants to run at full capacity, gas-based power to be used during peak demand. Railways assures availability of enough rakes for coal transport. Ukraine's President Zelensky says it's been a difficult night after Russia fired over 80 missiles at Ukraine, damaging critical infrastructure and residential buildings. Several people killed, many injured across 10 Ukrainian regions. Prime Minister Modi hosts his Australian counterpart Anthony Albanese at the Ahmedabad Cricket Stadium before the start of the fourth test match to celebrate the friendship between both nations. Both leaders took a lap of honour and a chariot around the Narendra Modi Stadium. Well, on to the day's trading action. Weak global queues denting sentiment on the large street. The markets failing to hold on to their opening gains ending at the day's low. The Nifty and the Sensex lost close to... A percent today. The Sensex fell over 500 points. The Nifty was down 160. The broader market's faring slightly better than the blue chips. BSC companies are raising a market gap of close to 2 lakh crore rupees. Surabhi joins us now to wrap up the day's trading action. Surabhi, uh, post holy, the markets are losing ground. Well, not a good day if you're a bull in this market at all because the bears really made a very strong comeback today. And it happened in a span of 24 hours. The market today undid a lot of the heavy lifting, the painful work that it was putting together over the last two to three sessions, particularly yesterday. So what's the problem? Well, not only did we close at the lowest point of the day today with this 1% drop, uh, the Nifty couldn't really hold on to yesterday's lows, uh, Wednesday's lows. And we finally ended below the 17,600 level. There was a lot of momentum on the downside. And that was evident in the, in the quality of stocks, the nature of stocks. I mean, a lot of large, heavyweight blue chips let this move down. And that includes names like Reliance Industries and ICICI Bank, or TCS. So this was not a, a sporadic move uh, structured by two or three smaller names. But the heavyweights were facing a lot of pressure today. Auto stocks were under pressure as well. Quite a few of the big ones like Mahindra and Mahindra, Tata Motors, Maruti, many of these names down between 2 to 3 percent. Mid caps did relatively better, but even towards the end of the session, the advanced decline ratio was favoring the declines, more declining stocks than advancing stocks. So again, it tells you that today's pressure was uh, fairly broad based and not something that you can ignore very, very lightly. There was some bottom fishing, but it was restricted mostly to some of the metal stocks, specifically the steel names. For instance, a uh, sale or a Tata Steel. That's why we saw some green pops. Uh, of course, there were individual names on the mid-cap side. A lot of uh, stocks moving around because of uh, big block trades like a Gokulas exports. But that was all news-based. If I go back to talking about the market's mood, well, caution seems to have certainly returned. And that's because of the reality check that uh, Friday you're getting into a very big event, which is a U.S. non-farm payroll data. Remember, it was that event, the January report, that literally set the cat among the pigeons. And we really need to see what the Feb number will look like and then how will those uh, interest rate projections in the U.S. move. For now, markets in India and around the world have gone back to watching the yields in the U.S. as well as the dollar index, both of which remain elevated. 
So, Rubi, many thanks for joining us. Staying with the markets, four out of the top of the 10 Adani Group stocks ended the day in the red today. The group gained a market cap of 4,500 crores for the day. The group stocks group current market cap stands at 9.2 lakh crore rupees. However, it is still valued 52% lower than what it was on the 24th of January. That's before the Hindenburg report was released. Meanwhile, the promoters have created additional pledges in some of the group companies. Adani Transmission has seen an increase of 0.76% in promoter pledges, while Adani Green has seen promoter pledges rise by nearly 1%. Vivek is standing by with the further details. Some pledges being repaid, some pledges being created. Vivek, take us through where things currently stand. Well, an important update coming in as far as two of the Adani Group stocks are concerned. Adani Transmission as well as Adani Green were in focus. So yesterday, post-market hours, there was a notification to the exchanges where the promoter has said that they've gone ahead and created an additional pledge of around 0.76% equity. This is in favor of SBI Cap Trustee. Now, the total promoter pledge you know, in favor of SBI Caps at this point of time stands at 1.32% in Adani Transmission. Coming to Adani Green, you know, the total promoter pledge in favor of SBI caps is 2%, indicating that there has been an additional 1% pledge that has been created in favor of the trustee SBI caps. So, now remember, February 8, 2023, the Adani group had actually pledged additional shares in favor of the SBI cap trustee. And remember, 1.6 crore shares was the total amount of shares that was actually pledged with the uh, SBI caps. Now, when you're talking about, you know, what exactly is the meaning of this, uh, SBI chairman had, in interaction to CNBC TV 18 had mentioned quite clearly that the Adani's promoters additional share pledge was basically to top up collateral for existing loans and the additional shares were not for a new loan or new pledges of the shares. In fact, on February 13th, there was a slight release in terms of pledges. There was almost a 0.1% equity that was released in Adani Green. Now, despite that, you know, the overall group continues to remain in focus, especially when it comes to promoter pledging activity and share back financing. Vivek, many thanks for joining us. Let's take stock of all the action in the commodity markets. Crude oil prices flat on larger than expected draw in U.S. crude stocks. That's not all worries of aggressive rate hikes by the Fed denting oil consumption also weighed on sentiment. Brent is around $83 a barrel. Key data point that's moving the markets. China's annual consumer inflation has slowed to a one-year low, opening the doors for further economic stimulus. The fall in inflation is being largely attributed to weak demand after the Chinese New Year. The consumer price index in February accelerated by 1%. This is well below the 2023 inflation target of 3%. Economists now expect China's central bank to ease monetary policy and propel growth. Well, the big CNBC TV 18 exclusive newsmaker this evening, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, says America wants to establish a close strategic alliance with India on semiconductors. Raimondo is in India along with the trade delegation for talks with Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal and other Indian ministers. Speaking exclusively to CNBC TV 18, Raimondo said 93% of the world cannot be dependent on just Taiwan for semiconductors. Take a look. We're not producing enough semiconductors and we're getting them all from either just Taiwan or just packaged mm -hmm. in Malaysia, and it exposes us to incredible uh, disruptions. So I think what India offers is, I think India stands to gain actually quite tremendously from the move for multinational companies wanting to be more resilient in their supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, staying with the issue of supply chain resilience, and you talked about the semiconductor shortage, and it wasn't just U.S. companies that were impacted. Companies here in India and across the world were impacted on account of specifically the semiconductor shortage that we saw. So on that front, the U.S. has made its intention very clear to manufacture semiconductors in the U.S. The CHIPS Act has been passed. Uh, I know you have said previously that America needs to lead this, and it is America's obligation to lead this. In India, we have just announced a package to also push uh, semiconductor manufacturing. But where do you then see the headroom for potential partnership and mm. collaboration between India and the U.S. when both sides are hoping to manufacture domestically? Yeah, and both can. Both can. Certainly, our goal is not to be self-sufficient. You know, so, you know, for, so for example, in semiconductors now, the United States and the world actually is, is overly dependent on Taiwan. 93% of the world's most advanced semiconductors are produced in Taiwan. That isn't, by no measure is yeah. that stable or resilient. Yeah, now, but having said that, we never expect to make all of the semiconductors that in America that we consume. 
That is not the goal. Mm. And in fact, we have, and I have said this many times, a desire to work closely with our allies, including India. And if I can just follow that up with, uh, you know, where is the engagement on this front with the Indian government as far as semiconductors specifically are concerned? Because as you said, uh, it serves our interest from a security standpoint. But at the end of the day, you also don't want to end up in a situation of overcapacity. And that's something that the yes. World Bank, et cetera, have cautioned countries about. So how do you balance? And it is going to be a yes. fine balance, as you point out. It will be difficult. So I don't want to break any news today that I'm not supposed <laughs> I was to. hoping. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm working very closely with my counterpart, uh, and tomorrow, tomorrow we'll have the official meetings of the CEO forum and the commercial dialogue, and we've been talking a great deal about semiconductors. And so uh, we will have a, f a formal discussion as between the U.S. government and the India government of India around semiconductors. How do we purposefully strategize and plan? Uh, you know, for example, um, India is home to a massive amount of uh, semiconductor design mm -hmm. talent. The United States uh, leads the world in semiconductor design. We have a <coughs> synergy there. Uh, the U.S. Commerce Secretary is also hopeful about resolving the differences uh, on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the IPF is an economic initiative launched by U.S. President Joe Biden. It's a grouping of 14 nations in the Indo-Pacific, including Australia, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, among others. These nations account for 40 percent of the world's GDP. China is a key absentee from this group, and the Chinese Foreign Ministry has called it an initiative to decouple China economically. However, India is not a full member of the group yet over differences on data and privacy. India and the U.S. are in agreement over three pillars of the IPF, which includes tax, anti-corruption and clean energy. The U.S. Commerce Secretary is hopeful of a resolution over the fourth pillar on data and privacy with India by the end of the year. We are moving forward at a speed that is uh, kind of unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I was with the president. He announced it last year uh, in Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, within months, we were all together. We signed off to the negotiating statements. In fact, your minister, Minister Goyal, said it was, he was like shocked <laughs> with the speed with which we were moving. Uh, I think uh, I'm hopeful. By the end we of don't this have year, any here, there's no, no something <laughs> here. I'm hopeful by the end of, by the end of this year, uh, we could we could have all of the agreements as between the governments uh, all signed populous. up. This is my hope and goal. You know, uh, my mother would say to me, "If you have something done, give it to a busy woman." So <laughs> I'm a busy woman, and I'm hoping to get this done by the end of the year. And you can catch the full interview with Gina Raimondo, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, right here on CNBC TV 18 at 7 p.m. Well, after a three-year hiatus, India and the U.S. are set to relaunch the commercial dialogue on the 10th of March. U.S. Commerce Secretary confirmed the development in an exclusive conversation with us. So what's on the agenda for both nations and what can we expect? Parikshit standing by with the details. Parikshit. Well, uh, whenever we have these high-level meetings between the commerce officials of both sides, there is, of course, a talk of greater market access. But the U.S., of course, has concerns around the Digital Competition Act that India is considering right now, similarly, uh, which is similar to what the European Union has in order to regulate big tech companies and check their market dominance. So there could be concerns around that expressed uh, by Gina Raimondo. At the same time, the U.S. delegation, the U.S. government is going to press for uh, greater focus on ease of doing business, uh, policy transparency as well. There is some amount of worry uh, among U.S. businesses that with an election in India around the corner, uh, will there be more regulations, more changes that could impact them directly? At the same time, a review of the tariff structure, standards, interoperability and compatibility is a very big issue for U.S. companies at a time when U.S. and India are looking at collaboration on 6G, 5G, on semiconductors, they would want India's standards on manufacturing, on accreditation to be in line with, uh, with global norms as well. So let's wait and see what happens. But of course, uh, there would be a discussion in order to make uh, ease of doing business uh, further easier and also uh, removal of some of the non-tariff barriers as well.
All right, Parikshit, many thanks for joining us. A quick check of some of the other headlines. The Abu Dhabi Investment Authority is set to invest $500 million in eyewear startup Lenscart. A report by Bloomberg says the sovereign fund will buy a mix of existing shares and new equity in the company. The deal is likely to be announced this week and it could value Lenscart at $4 billion. Radis Corp, an arm of Geo, is all set to acquire US-based telecom solution provider Mimosa Network for $60 million on a debt and cash-free basis. Geo's management says the acquisition will accelerate innovation to manufacture telecom network products. The power ministry has framed a multi-pronged strategy to ensure that there is adequate power supply during summer. Abhimanyu joins us now with the details. Abhimanyu, what is the power ministry's plan? As the power demand is expected to rise in the next few weeks, power sector companies have been asked to ensure no load shedding during the summer season. The power ministry has formulated a multi-pronged strategy to ensure power availability for summers. NTPC will run its 5,000 megawatt gas-based power stations during the crunch period in April and May, and power utilities will undertake maintenance for coal-based power plants well in advance from the peak demand period. While the railways has agreed to provide 418 rakes to different subsidiaries of Coal India, GSS, and other other captive blocks, Gale has assured the power ministry of ample supply of gas in case gas-based power is to be used to meet peak demand. 4,000 megawatt of additional gas-based power capacity is slated to be added by other entities for power availability during summers. All hydropower plants have been also instructed to operate in consultation with regional or state load dispatch centers to optimize water utilization. An additional capacity of 2,920 megawatts will be made available through new coal-based plants which are to be commissioned in March. The Central Electricity Authority has estimated a peak power demand of 229 gigawatts in April 2023. Abhimanyu, many thanks for joining us. Time for us to head into a break, but when we return, Ukraine has been blistering its defences to fight back Russian invasion, even as Russian missiles found key cities. We get you a story from inside one of the bunkers when we return. Russian missiles repeatedly hitting several cities across Ukraine, including Kyiv, the port city of Odessa and Kharkiv. Ukrainian forces said they shot down 34 missiles in the overnight attack. Ukraine's nuclear plant was also hit, causing a disruption in power supply. Sanjay Suri gets us more on the Ukrainian military's preparedness from inside a bunker at an undisclosed location in Ukraine. Just off a common street, whose location we are advised not to disclose, we stepped down into a bunker. Hidden from view, this is an operational military hub. Armed members of this unit stay away for the moment, their arms and ammunition kept away from the camera. What you can see is stocks of food and water to keep this unit supplied for quite a long time. This is the bunker of a very special paramilitary unit of the Ukrainian army that has been working with regular troops to provide them information, and that information has been critical. It was this unit that contributed with information that halted the Russian advance to Kyiv at the start of the invasion last year. The commander who has been with this unit since the start of the Donbas war in 2014 tells us something of what this unit has been doing. When the Russians advanced a year ago, members of our unit worked with the military who blew up bridges that stopped the Russian advance to Kyiv. And we used our drones to give our military the positions of the Russians. The unit is clearly dug in here in anticipation of and in preparation for further action to follow. This is where we can sit out under prolonged bombing and where we can remain prepared and ready to deal with the enemy whenever that need arises. This place can hold food for 30 to 50 people for up to a year. Everything here is been prepared and geared for a possible new invasion and People are ready in ways that are seen, but mostly unseen, to stop any new Russian invasion from proceeding very far at all. 
Sanjay Suri there reporting from inside Ukraine. Veteran actor and director Satish Kaushik died this morning in New Delhi after suffering a cardiac arrest. He was 66. Kaushik began his film career in 1983 with Masoom and has acted in more than 100 films since then. He won two Filmfare Awards for Best Comedian and is best remembered for roles like his role in Mr. India, Ram Lakhan and Divana Mastana. Kaushik also directed over a dozen films. He leaves behind his wife and daughter. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Business 360. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. The news continues when we return.